Hello folks, welcome back, um, or I should say welcome for the first time because this is a, a new kind of stream. Uh, it's one that people have asked me for for a while. Um, and it's basically, you know, taking, look, taking a look at core crates in the Rust ecosystem and looking at sort of how they work, like what's happening under the surface here. Um, not necessarily like read through all the code, maybe that could be interesting too and a, a sort of separate thing, but rather like I wanna understand um, this crate better. So we're not gonna be like, after watching this, you're not gonna immediately know how to like make changes to Surday's like proc macro code. That That's not the goal. The goal is for you to have a better understanding of what actually goes on when you're using Surday. Um, whether that is uh, uh, deriving serialized and deserialized or implementing your own, implementing your own data formats. Like basically what's the mental model you should use, um, the, the basic constructs are in use by the library, um, maybe some of the, the design decisions and subtleties that are useful to know. Um, and Surday seemed like a great place to start because so many people use Surday every day uh, and don't really know how it works, um, which is not to their detriment. Like it, 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 there is a lot of, um, in some sense, it's a it's a compliment to Surdy that you don't have to know exactly how it works in order to be able to use it, um, but it makes it very worthwhile to dig into a little bit. Um, we are also in a position where, uh, because of scheduling Snafu, um, I actually have a hard stop for this in a little under two hours, which means that I'm going to try to be efficient, which is not always something I'm good at, but we'll see how well that goes. Um, speaking of scheduling. Um, I've also started now committing to a regular streaming schedule, which people have asked for a while. Um, so every fourth Friday, so that is today and four Fridays from now and so on, uh, I'm going to do a stream at this time. Uh, I'm going to stick to the UTC time. So if, if there are like daylight savings and stuff, then the UTC time is going to be the, the correct one. The UTC time is going to be 6 PM. Um, and my plan is to stick to that for the foreseeable future. Maybe it ends up changing if I move to Europe and such, but but at least this is the, the starting plan. Um, I put this on Mastodon and co-host as well, and there's a link to a calendar that you can actually like subscribe to uh, so that you can see when the streams come up and add it to your calendar. Uh, so at least that's the start. Uh, and without further ado, I think we should just dive into Surdy. Um, first of all, how do you pronounce Surdy? Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know whether it says anywhere. I feel like I've seen, uh, and I know this is not the most important thing, I'm fully aware, uh, but I feel like it says somewhere. Oh, maybe I forget. But so Surdy is a is a library that's short for serialization and deserialization. So Sir D, um, but I've also heard it described as Surda. Uh, or surd, which is also weird. I think it's just surdy, but you know, who knows at this point. Um, and the goal of surdy is not actually to provide any particular serialization or deserialization format. Instead, its goal is to provide the infrastructure for doing serialization and deserialization, specifically of, of um, Rust data structures. Uh, and it's it tries to do so in a way where in the general case, uh, it gives you fairly high efficiency and performance. It doesn't always give you like a zero cost abstraction between the the data that you have and the the data data format that you're writing to. But but the general goal is for it to be a relatively sort of thin glue layer that hopefully mostly gets optimized out. Um, and Surdy has a bunch of concepts that are really useful to, to sort of get into your head when you start working with or try going beyond just the very basic like derive surdy. Um, and the the start for that is the surdy data model. And there's a page on this on the surdy docs that's pretty good. Um, but basically, and in fact, maybe I should draw this. I haven't drawn for a while. That seems maybe appropriate. Um, let's go with a nice, uh, orange serialization color here. Uh, so Surdy has a data model that consists of sort of three parts. So we're just gonna make them arbitrary shapes. 
Um, so one is the data format. Uh, one is the, let's call it data type. And one is the SERDI data model. Uh, and in terms of the actual type in SERDI, the data type is the Rust data type that's in use. So in general, that's going to be uh, blue is types, right? We all agree that blues, blue things are types. Um, so this is where you have serialize and deserialize. And I apologize for my handwriting. Uh, over here is where you have serializer. Notice the, notice the er and deserializer. Um, and the goal of the SERDI data model is basically to provide the mapping between these. So in serializer and deserializer, the only thing that you know about, the only thing that those traits provide you information about is stuff from the data model. So essentially the data model provides a sort of layer of, um, not just a layer of abstraction, but, but um, encapsulation, so to speak, so that so that there's a, a separation of concerns between the data format and the, the data type. Each data format only needs to sort of know about the SERDI data model, and each data type also only needs to know about the SERDI data model. Um, and then the, the sort of little bit in between here takes care of mapping one to the other. Uh, we'll talk more about the concrete specifics here. Um, you might also have heard of the visitor type. Um, we'll look at that a little bit as well. And the visitor type lives over here. Um, and it's also a thing that's... it's Visitor is a little weird because it's sort of a little bit a part of here uh, in that the serializer and deserializers will make use of visitor, um, but visitor is implemented by the data type. It's sort of owned by the data type side of things. Um, and it's essentially part of the interface, which serialize and deserialize is too. Um, but, but that is sort of the, the abstraction boundary that you get here. Um, and so you might wonder, well, what is the SERDI data model? And so that's what we're gonna look at next. So the SERDI data model is mostly a set of types. And this is a set of types that um, they're not entirely arbitrarily chosen, but they're chosen to represent the kinds of primitives that we usually have for data, right? So these are the numeric types, um, the string type, byte arrays, uh, options, units, um, structs, and various kinds of structs. So unit structs, new type structs, and um, just regular data structs, um, and enums and their constituent components. So this is things like uh, unit variant, new type variants, and just straight up enum variants. Um, uh, sequences, which can be, you know, whether there's a vector or vec DQ, it doesn't really matter to certainty. It's just a sequence of elements that has some order, uh, and tuples and maps. So these are all the things that are in the SERDI data model. And the goal for any given data type is to, um, for, for serialize, is to uh, take the data that's stored in the Rust data type and turn it into one of these, right? So if you internally have, you know, a field that is a, I don't know, um, non-zero U size, then you're going to emit that as a U64 into the SERDI data model. So when the SERDI data model asks you, how do you get serialized? You answer with using U64 in the data model. Um, and for deserialize is sort of the other way where you say, my type can be constructed from the following types in the data model. So if, if your type contains, again, let's say a, a non-zero U64, um, you might say, I can be created from the following unsigned integer types from the SERDI data model. Uh, and then the, there are other variants of this, right? So you could say, for example, structs you could possibly construct from anything that is a map, as long as the keys of the map map to the names of the fields in the struct. So you can get a, you can start to get a sort of sense for for how that mapping works on the data type to data model um, side. On the data format side, your goal with the with the data model is to figure out how the 
the bytes of the serialized format map into the data model. So for serializer, um, the goal is to take types from the data model and turn them into the bytes of the serialized protocol, right? So you're going to be told, you know, here is a sequence, um, and then you're going to be told about the elements of the sequence, one after the other. Uh, and the goal of the serializer implementation is to turn those into whatever the bytes for a sequence with things of that particular type are, or how those are represented in the data format. And for deserializer, so going the other way, um, your goal is to take the stuff that you're getting out of the, um, the underlying data format and turn them into the SERTI data model. And when I say turn it into, that's not actually, uh, it's not like you're turning it into like a value in memory, but instead the, the way that the, the mapping here works is that when the data format is, or the deserializer in particular, encounters something of a given type, it calls a method through the SERTI data model, such as, let's say, deserialize, um, technically it's visit, but just for, for clarity here, deserialize string. Like I found a string, I found a string as described in the SERTI data model, and that ultimately ends up calling the deserialize string on the deserialize of the data type. But these two are disconnected. So you can take an, any data format and any data type and sort of say, connect these two, right? Like use this data format to turn something into this type. And that's one of the ways in which sort of becomes really, really um, versatile. Uh, is that you can mix and match these. So this is why you can put, you know, derive deserialize on one of your Rust types, um, and then you can deserialize them from both TOML and JSON. Is because when you're using the the JSON deserializer, what you do is you pass in your type, and when the deserializer run, it's going to call the deserialize methods on your derived deserialized type. Or you can pass in the to you can do the the TOML deserializer again. Pass in your type, and when it calls the the sort of deserialize or the visit methods, uh, those will end up going to your data type again. And and um, because it all goes through the SERTI data model, you know if if there's a string in the TOML or a string in the JSON, they will both end up calling the same method through the data model, which ends up call calling uh, your method on the data type. Okay, does that make sense so far? I'm just in terms of the, the sort of mental model. We're going to dig into what the code actually looks like as well. But just before we, we go for, forward, I think it's useful to uh, ensure that this sort of relative separation makes sense. Uh, does this kind of model have performance implications? Might have a straight JSON parser be far faster or fewer allocations in SERTI? Um, it's possible. Like, SERTI doesn't claim to be like a zero cost abstraction. Um, that said, the, the deserializers, they, they don't, um, they don't actually generally do allocation unless it's specifically necessary. Like, um, if you visit a, if if you give a give give the JSON deserializer like a a string like a stir reference, then when the deserializer walks at stir and gets and sort of encounters something that it discovers is a a string in JSON, um, it can actually just give a slice of that into the the data model to say I encountered a string here's a reference to it. So it doesn't actually need to do any allocation. It only does the mapping to the data model. That's not always possible though, right? Imagine um, uh, the, the best example for this is probably uh, when you have escape values in the string. Um, so imagine someone using like backslash something in a JSON string. Then now you can't actually just give a reference to that string in through the data model because you actually need to decode the escapes. Um, and so that means you have to allocate a new string. You don't really have an option. And then you pass that own string in. But but even so, in, in both of these cases, this is the same kind of thing that you would need to do in a manual implementation. And so it's really just generics going all the way through. Okay. 
so I think we have a, a rough sense of what's going on here. So what we're actually going to do now is dive in the complete deep end on the other side um, and do, let's see, cargo new lib. Um, nah, fine, let's do a bin. Um, what are we going to call this? We're going to call it uh, 30 what now? Okay, and we're going to go in here and we're going to say 30 equals 1 and we're actually going to pull in the derive feature so that we can derive deserialize. Um, and then we're going to go to source main and then we're going to use Uh, this, and then we're going to derive serialize, deserialize on what type? Struct foo, which has an A, which is a U64, uh, and a B, which is a string. And then we're going to go ahead and just do cargo expand. Uh, expand. Just going to expand all the macros. Let's see what it generates. Okay, so obviously, you know, this is a proc macro, so it generates a lot of stuff. Let's see if I can just put that in a expanded.rs. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff here. You see there's like a bunch of macro tricks that you have to play, like this anonymous const here, which is used to basically generate a new scope where we know that um, we can only have impulse, where we know that we can control the, uh, the namespace a little bit better. Um, so this is not generally stuff that you need to think about in terms of writing your own sturdy stuff. This is just like macro magic, uh, these lines here. Uh, same with the automatically derived attribute here. Um, it has to do with whether it's considered like unused code for the purposes of warnings and stuff. Uh, so you can ignore that as well. Where it gets interesting is down here. Okay, so we have implement serialized for foo. And so let's go before we move on to... 30, uh, serialize. So the serialize trait, again, this is on the data type side of things, not the data format. Um, the serialize trait just says, how do you serialize yourself? That's all it does. And it's given access to a serializer, but it's generic over that serializer. Um, and the job of serialize, as we talked about before, is to turn self into the data model of 30. And the way you do that is by calling the appropriate method on serializer. So serializer here has a bunch of methods that correspond to the, the different components of the data model. So the goal for your implementation of serialize is to call the appropriate serialize method on the serializer that you're passed. So remember, serializer here could be, for example, a JSON serializer. It could be a TOML serializer. You don't know. All you know is that um, that encapsulation boundary. All you get to know is the data model. Um, and so, you know, you might, if you contain a bool, you would serialize a bool. If you're a struct, realistically, what you're going to do is probably call the serialize struct method, um, which in order to call, you have to pass in the name of the struct for some protocols. You actually want to encode the, the names of the types as well. Um, you're told the length, so the, as in the number of fields in the struct. And interestingly, when you call serialize struct, you don't pass in anything else. You get back one of these serialized struct things. Um, and this is a common pattern in 32 that for more complex structures, you have sort of sub-serializers for things like sequences and tuples and enums and maps and structs. Uh, so here you see there's an associated type on serializer. So we're still on serializer here. Uh, there are associated types for each of these. And in particular, there's a there's a associated type for serialized struct, which implements the serialized struct trait, which has the method serialized field and end. Uh, it also has skip field. Um, this is so that you can have a type where you explicitly communicate that you're skipping a field during serialization, which sometimes matters, right? So th there's some protocols where you're expected to produce a uh, complete description of the value. And so if you choose not to include a field, you have to say so in the, the serialized format. 
And so the idea here is that if you want to serialize a struct, if you in you're implementing serialize, right, and you're serializing a struct, you're going to call the serialize struct method uh, on the serializer you're given in, um, giving the name of the struct and the number of fields. And in the thing you get back, you're going to call serialize field repeatedly for each field you want to serialize, and then call end when you have finished serializing the struct. Okay. So if we go back to the code, the, the generated code, hopefully that's what we should see, right? So you see here, all of these like underscores and stuff is again, just macro bits um, that we don't need to worry too much about the complexities of it. You see that there's a return type, which is a result that can either be, you know, okay or error. This is also dictated by the serializer. Um, so for some serializers, they'll actually return the serialized data format in okay. Um, usually though, like if you create a you know a JSON serializer or something, it actually just wraps an I/O writer. So the OK value here is just empty. It actually gets written to a buffer somewhere or just directly to disk. This again to avoid overhead of first having to serialize like into a byte string or something and then putting it to disk. And the error is both errors in the serializer, but can also be errors in the serialization serialization into the data model. Well, we'll see that as we go a little bit further down. Um, okay, so you see here we create, we call serialize struct, so that's what we expected. Um, we pass in foo, which is the name of the struct, so the, so the macro, the proc macro here, because we put derive serialize on foo, it knows that the name of the struct is foo, passes that in here. Uh, this again is some macro magic, um, and what this ultimately ends up giving us is the number two, which is indeed the number of fields in foo. Why it's written out this way, macros are complicated. I'm sure there's a good reason, um, mostly irrelevant to what we're talking about now. Um, and you see that if serialized struct completes successfully, then we assign the value that we get back, which is this sort of constructor, if you will, that we're gonna call serialized field on into 30 state. And if it errors, we return. So this is basically the question mark operator is what's going on here. Um, and I'm guessing it generates it this way so that it works with older versions of Rust as well. That would be my guess here. Um, okay, and then you see, then it calls serialize field. Um, it serializes the field A by calling serialize field, um, giving A as the, key, the field name and giving a reference to the value of A as the second uh, argument. So if we go back here and look at serialized field, you see that the, the second argument to serialized field is a reference to the value of the field, which is also expected to implement serialize. Right, so this is how it sort of nests. So when you're serializing a struct, what you're actually doing is you are serializing each field. You're, you're first telling the serializer, here comes a struct, it has this name and this number, number of fields. And then for each field, you tell the serializer, this field has this value. And when you give the value, you give a thing that itself implements serialize. So then we're gonna call the serialize methods on each of those values um, and give those into the, to the data format as well, right? They also need to map into the data model. Um, and so, you know, if that succeeds, then we continue, otherwise we return. Again, this is just question mark. Uh, and we do the same thing for B, and then we call end, and that's the end of serialize. So if we were to write this ourselves, right? So instead of deriving serialize, we could um, impl serialize for foo. And all we would do is, you know, struct is serializer dot serialize struct uh, foo and two question mark uh, s dot serialize field a self a b self b and then s dot end and um, this it's complaining because we need to import the serialize struct trait um, and this needs to be mute, that's fine. So now we've replicated the same thing that serialize did. That this is all the derived serialize actually does. Now, 
that's not quite fair to say, right? So there are other things that serialize does. Namely, it's configurable. So if you do thing, if you do serialize, right, you can do things like surdy skip. And so if we now go ahead and comment this out, let's look at how that changes what gets generated. So cargo expand, vim expanded. Uh, if we go now back up to serialize. Um, so you see that now in the generated code, serialize struct, serialize field A, but there's no code for the, fi the field that we ended up uh, skipping. I'm curious why this doesn't call skip. So remember in the data model, there's a skip field. Not sure why it doesn't call that. That seems odd. Um, uh, it's not using question mark because question mark produces slower code and larger binary size to the implicit into conversion being done. Oh, I see. That's fair. Yeah. So here, um, so, so remember the, the question mark operator in Rust actually is not quite equivalent to this code. Um, it is slightly different. So if this were written in with question mark, what it would actually generate is, uh, this, um, so it, it has a call to into to allow conversion of error types. And this is one of the ways in which question mark makes it nicer to work with error types is that the error type doesn't need to exactly match. It just needs to be compatible with the thing you return. Um, but this of course is extra machinery, extra stuff that the compiler has to run on. Uh, and in this case, it's entirely unnecessary because we know that the error type is directly translatable here. And so therefore we, we do it with this. Um, Okay, uh, so that's an example of the kind of attribute that you can get. And there are other ones, right? So if we did here, uh, let's say rename equals uh, X. So now this one, uh, in fact, then of course we're not gonna skip it. And if we now look at what it generates, you see that instead of saying that this field was called B, it says that the field is called X. So in general, all of these additional attributes that you can put on serialization, most of them are just relatively simple modifications to the serialization code that gets generated. There are some exceptions, right? So you can do things like completely switch what serializer is being used for this type. But at the same time, even that's not that complicated. It just means that in the generated code, instead of calling, you know, the um, the standard serialize implementation for B, so instead of just using this, you're going to construct, you're going to call some other type here to do the the serialization itself. Um, we're not going to get too much into that, but just so you're aware, and and it's it's sometimes fun to you can read the sort of derived code and it's sometimes a little hard to parse because it needs to do a lot of like token manipulation. But with Cargo Expand, it's usually pretty easy to figure out, you know, what actually happened under the under the hood here. Uh, okay, so that's serialize. We're going to talk a little bit more about serialize later. Um, but for now, let's move over to deserialize and see what that looks like. Uh, so I've removed the rename. Then we go back here. And we go back to deserialize. You see for deserialize too, it generates this sort of macro wrapping stuff um, that we can mostly ignore. And for the implementation of deserialize for foo, um, here you see it's the, the structure is similar, right? So there's a deserialize method, takes a deserializer uh, that's generic over the deserializer trait. Um, now, there are a couple of things that are gonna be different here. And the first one is this DE um, generic lifetime parameter. This one is more or less a reference to the input that the deserializer is working over. Uh, so imagine something like surdy JSON. If you call surdy JSON from string or from bytes, um, so anything where you actually have a, it has a reference to its input, then in order, to, basically for efficiency, we want to be able to return references into that input, right? So imagine there's some like huge string in there, for example, that we really just want to return a reference to directly rather than having to like copy it out into an own string. Then what is the lifetime of that string reference? That's what DE is. It is a reference into the origin data for the deserializer if available. 
Some deserializers aren't going to have this, right? So if you're reading from disk, for example, then this lifetime is static and you're never going to produce any owned references, any borrowed references. You're only going to return own data. So if you read you know, from disk and you're deserializing JSON and the thing that you get out is actually a string reference, what you're going to do is construct a string. Um, because by the time you read more from the file, a reference into the, like the buffer that you read from disk is no longer going to be valid. So you're only going to generate owned values. Um, okay, so that that's where the DE reference comes from. Um, we'll we'll see this come up later as well. And then the implementation here, you see, we start talking about this visitor um, thing, and visitor is um, hmm, what's the best way to describe this? The visitor pattern is Cerny's way of making it easy to deserialize um, sort of nested structures. So in some sense, you can think of this as sort of the inverse of what we're doing with serialization, where things like serialize struct actually return a constructor that you then calls, you know, serialized field on and whatever. With visitors, that's sort of the inverse pattern where it's not quite as easy to do that with associated types. With visitors, you can do it pretty easily. Um, so let's let's see what that actually looks like. So in this case, um, Surti generates uh, this private, private type, in this case an enum, um, that is a field visitor. That's what it's called it here, which is going to visit, it's going to be the thing that visits each of the fields of the struct. Uh, and it implements visitor for it. So let's go look at visitor. Uh, so if we go back to Surti here. So we have uh, deserialize. So it's given a deserializer. That's fine. And deserializer has all of these, uh, no, that's not what I want, visitor here. Yeah, so so the the bits you want here is that when you call deserialize, ultimately you're, what you're given is a deserializer. Uh, and what you have to tell the deserializer is, what do you want it to deserialize? What do you expect it to deserialize? And you can say deserialize any, which is, you know, as the, as the thing that's being deserialized into, you can say, I don't know what type this is going to be. You just, you need to know ahead of time. This only works for self-describing formats. Um, so, you know, formats where the underlying data type actually encodes things like this is a map, this is the start of end of a field, that kind of stuff. So JSON, for example, has a deserialize any. There are some, especially compact binary formats, where if you told it, just give me whatever comes next, right? If it's a string, give me a string. If it's a number, give me a number. It's just a sequence of bytes with no structured information. And so the deserializer would go, I don't know what comes next. You have to tell me. Um, and so the, there's this sort of mm, separation here between self-describing formats and non-self-describing formats. And in general, all of these deserialized bool, deserialized i8, et cetera, um, the deserialize any is going to sort of forward into these methods if it can detect the type. And for data structures where it cannot detect the type, it's going to just refuse an error out, saying, you told me to guess the type, and I cannot guess the type. Um, so in general, when you implement deserialize, what you want to do is give the deserializer information about what you're expecting to come next. So if you know that the next field you're going to deserialize is, let's say, a U size, then you should call deserialize U size. Or, U size is a bad example here, U64. So if you know the next field is going to be U64, you should tell the deserializer, the next thing I want from you is a U64. Because that way, if the data format is not self-describing, it still can actually decode and give you what you needed. Um, now, what you'll see here is that when you call any of these deserialize methods, um, you give in a visitor. And this is where the, the, the mapping is a little odd, right? So you tell the deserializer what I want now or what what is coming next in the data format is a U16. Or to take a slightly more complex example, um, the next thing that's going to come is a sequence. And then you give it a visitor. 
and the visitor is what the deserializer is going to call methods on when it does in fact find that sequence. So you tell it when you hit a when like the next thing you find is a sequence and when you find that sequence use this visitor to explore that sequence. So you see all of these consume self. So the you end up basically passing um control back and forth between the implementation of deserialize into the deserializer which which consumes self so it this is now where where execution is happening um it is going to then you know find this a sequence and then call a method on the visitor and the visitor is then going to call deserializer again and then we go back and forth well we'll see how that works when we start looking at the code here and so visitor uh has visit bool, visit i8. So these are roughly equivalent to deserialize from the data model, right? So this is saying, so in the deserializer, when it finds the thing you asked it for, then it will call the appropriate visit method on the visitor that it was passed in. Um, so again, if you use, for example, tell the data, data model, let's say uh, deserialize bytes, then the data when you take the the data format is then going to presumably call visit bytes in response okay so let's get with that in mind let's see what it actually generated for us here uh, so the field visitor here is going to be vis a visitor for the fields of the struct right so when you encode a struct usually you want to emit both the fields and the values um, think of something like json right if we were to see if you if you had this struct, this foo struct that we have, serializes JSON, the way that would look like in the JSON is like, you know, string A colon and some number, string B colon and some string. And so the field visitor is going to be the visitor for the keys of that, um, of the, the underlying lying data format. And then presumably there's going to be a value visitor further down. Um, you see that the value that the field visitor produces is field, which in this case is an enum saying field zero or field one, um, which corresponds to you know A and B. Now ignore here is interesting, which is this this comes from the fact that um, 30 by default. Let me dig up the docs here to make sure I'm not lying to you. Um, 30 by default will allow unknown fields. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The primary one is backwards compatibility, where if someone, imagine that you're like deserializing JSON or something, and if the underlying um, JSON files that you're parsing actually changes, like someone adds a field to it, your code shouldn't necessarily break, right? If if there's just more data in the JSON, then this is a great way to just be able to subset that information or just allow the underlying JSON to evolve over time while you are still able to run because all the stuff you cared about is still in there. And so you can set certain deny unknown fields to say every field must be in my data type. If you ever encounter a field in the data format that I don't have in my data type, that should error. Um, rather than just be ignored. And so this is where that ignore comes from, which is if we encounter a field while deserializing that isn't one of the ones we know about, then it's going to be mapped to this ignore field and then get ignored. If we pass deny unknown fields, this enum variant wouldn't be there. Um, and we would end up erroring instead if we were to encounter a field that, that we couldn't map. Um, so on visitor, there's this expecting method, um, which is primarily used for error message gener generation. So this is, you know, if you've ever done, you know, SERTI deserialization and you see a message like, you know, expected something, did not get that, uh, or got something else. Usually you don't necessarily get the got something else. You just get, um, you know, unknown or unexpected input expected X. Uh, that expecting comes from here. So this would be something like, um, imagine that you are visiting a JSON structure, a dictionary or a, a map, if you will, in JSON. Um, every field, every key has to be a string. But if you're, if you're in, if the data format is in the process of visiting a dictionary and it's encountering a key, so you're in sort of this field mode, 
uh, and then it finds something that isn't a string, then it's going to call expecting. And the way this works in practice is, I think they can be numbers too. Uh, I think it's only strings and numbers, but I could be lying. Um, and the way this works is actually pretty simple in sort of Rust type terms, which is that there's a default implementation for all of these visit methods. So if we look at visit bool, for example, the default implementation just calls, well, error invalid type. Let's see if we can find the, uh, oh, these are not, uh, these aren't great examples because these actually have specialized implementations. Um, but I thought there was a expecting call to expecting in here. Right. So here for visit bill, for example, uh, it says error invalid type and it passes in, you know, unexpected bool and the unexpected type when it gets debug printed, uh, I guess I can go back to using this search. Um, the expected type, when it's debug printed, uh, will use the expecting method of the visitor to say what was expected instead of what you actually got. So if the, so the default implementation for the various visit methods is to emit a message saying, I got this, I expected this. And for the, I expected this part, it's going to print what the expecting method of visitor is. So in this case, the expecting for field visitor is gonna be field identifier, right? So we're expecting a field uh, or something that is a struct field. Um, and then we're gonna override the implementation of visit U64 because U64 is um, how we're gonna, okay, so this here is, we're gonna allow two ways to encode the struct. We're gonna allow people to encode it as the, zeroth field on the first field. So if if you are visiting a dictionary, CERTA basically allows you to say you can either produce the fields in order where the keys is the, the index of the field. So in this case, you can see, you know, field zero. If the value of the key is zero, then it gets mapped to field zero, which we know is A. If it's one, it gets mapped to field one. And it also has a visit stir, which is A or B, which gets mapped to zero and one. It also allows visiting bytes. So if if it's not a string, but it happens to be bytes, this could be something like, you know, the underlying data format doesn't support strings. It only knows about byte slices, but that's okay if there's a byte slice that represents the string A, that's just as, just as good. Um, and so in this case, you know, numbers are okay as long as they're the field indices and Strings and bytes are okay if they map to the, the names of the field. So that's the visitor implementation for this field visitor. And we'll see how that gets used a little bit further down. Um, and so now we can implement deserialize for field, right? So again, this is, this is just a field visitor. And so we wanna implement deserialize for field because ultimately what we're gonna do is say, we wanna deserialize a map and the visitor is going to be a visitor that alternates between getting fields and getting values. And the fields therefore need to implement deserialize and the values need to implement deserialize. So now what we're doing is we're implementing deserialize for the field part of that deserialization process. So down here we de implement deserialize for field and that's going to deserialize, ooh, deserialize identifier. That's interesting. I didn't know it had a deserialize, deserialize identifier. Huh. I'm surprised it's special case. It might just be to give better error messages. Uh, although maybe there are some data formats where identifiers are kept as a, are encoded differently. That could totally be. Um, okay. So it, Deserialized identifier, it's not super important which method it called here, um, but it's basically telling the deserializer, okay, the next thing you should expect now is something that's an identifier and you should visit it using the field visitor, which is the thing that we just con constructed further above. 
So that's all you need for the deserialize here is just to use the visitor we just had and then call the appropriate deserialize method on the deserializer. And here, you know, you could have called deserializer any, uh, deserialize any, but if you did, the data format underneath has to be self-describing. But by calling deserialize identifier, even data formats that aren't self-describing will roughly know what thing they're expected to produce. And so they might actually now succeed where previously they would not. Uh, okay, and then we're going to have a visitor for uh, for all of Foo, right? So ultimately what we're trying to produce with this deserialize implementation is we're trying to deserialize into a Foo. So we need a visitor that produces a Foo. And that's what this thing is. So here uh, we implement visitor for this anonymous visitor types. And it produces here a value of type foo. So this is the visitor that's actually going to produce what we want. The expecting message here is we expect to destruct foo. Okay, great. Um, and we're going to implement here visit seek and visit map. And those are the only two things we're going to implement. So again, this comes back to um, we want to be helpful in that um, the data format is allowed to serialize structs as the fields se um, serialized in order. It doesn't need to capture the fields, right? There are some data formats where because the fields are static, like if you actually have a, like a, you know, a, a highly compressed and optimized storage format that's standardized, it has a schema, then you don't need to put the fields, the, the like string contents of the fields into the data format. This, the order of the values is all you need. So that's why we want to be able to deserialize from just a sequence that produces the fields in order. Um, yeah, so G gRPC, for example. Uh, so visit seek here is going to be, so seek access here is... Um, access to something that is a sequence. So this is a, this is one of the associated types on deserializers um, that allow them to basically have a, you might have a, if you have a you know, JSON deserializer, it has a different impl that just deals with stuff that has to do with arrays um, that implements a seek access trait. Uh, and that produces things like next element, right? So here for visit seek, we're first gonna try to access the next element of the um, of the sequence that we're currently in, that we're visiting. Um, and we're gonna try to deserialize that as a U64, which is the type of the first field. If we get it, great, that's the value of field zero. If we don't, it's an error. Uh, yeah, and it, you know, we can produce error messages here saying, if what we got is actually if, if what we got is the end of the iterator, right? So remember, our next element here is basically like an iterator. So if, if what we got back here is none saying the sequence has ended, then we say, well, we expected to get two elements and we didn't. Um, but ultimately, field zero here, uh, assuming all of this ended up in the, the OK branches, uh, field zero here is going to be the value of field zero, so which is the U64, which is the field A. Uh, and then field one, we do the same thing, call next element, tell it to deserialize as a string. Uh, and this could be any type here, right? It's any type that implements, implements deserialize. Um, and we do the same thing. If we stop, then we say, you know, we expected two elements. Uh, ultimately, field one is going to contain the string value of whatever was deserialized. And now that we're done, right, now that we have the values for both fields, all we have to do is say, great, we succeeded. This uh, visit seek succeeded and it produced a value foo where A is field zero and B is field one. And I think you can already see where this is going for visit map. It does the same thing, right? So it, um, ooh, this is a very long line. Okay, so this starts out, I guess it's structured a little differently. This starts out by saying field zero and field one are both options that are set to none. And, and the reason why it has to do it this way is because you don't know if, if the Q 
key, if the field name is encoded in the data structure, that means they could come out of order. So you don't know which you're going to get first. So therefore, um, you can't just like read one and store it in a value and then read the other and store it in a var variable because you wouldn't know the types of the two variables because they could be in either order. Uh, and so instead, you create variables for both of them, say that they're options, store them as none. Um, and then you keep asking for the next key in the, so see this uses map access instead of seek access. Keep asking for the next key. Um, and then you look at, okay, which key did I get out? Which field, right? So this is saying deserialize the next key as a field. This is why we have the deserialize implementation for field in the first place. And if it's field zero, then if we already have a value for field zero, then we say, this is not okay, duplicate field. Uh, otherwise, we try to decode the next value from the map as a U64, which is the type we know the field zero has. Uh, and now we have a value for field zero. If the key that we got is field one, we do the same thing. We all check whether we already have a value for field one. And if assuming we don't, then we last for the next value, say deserialize it as a string. Again, this could be any type um, and store it in field one. And any other fields, we just ignore. And so we say, you know, give us any value and we're just gonna ignore it. Uh, and then ultimately down here, we're gonna check that we indeed have a value for field zero and we have a value for field one. If we don't, we emit like a missing field error. Uh, and then we produce again, foo with A set to field zero and B set to field one. And so now this, remember this is still the visitor, right? This is the visitor implementation for the type that can visit a foo value. And so then we need to tie that into um, a call to the deserializer, and that call is pretty straightforward. Um, that call down here is just saying, deserializer, deserialize a struct. So telling the data format, the next thing you should try to grab from the, the data stream is a struct. Um, this is just self, right? So this could be written as um, this, those are equivalent. Um, the only reason it's written like this, I think, is because you don't need the to use the trait, like bring the trait into scope. Uh, you give the name of the struct. Uh, you give the list of fields. Um, and again, this is because the data format might actually need to know the fields and the order that they're defined in. So we pass that in. This is just a requirement of deserialize struct. And then we pass in the visitor, which is ultimately the thing that we wrote up here. And so what that's going to end up doing, right, is it's going to call the deserializer. The deserializer is going to continue walking its input stream, its data format, um, looking for, uh, you know, whatever comes next. If it discovers that the next thing that came in was a map, then it's going to call visit map on this visitor. And then the visit map code runs, which is going to call back into the deserializer's map access, saying, give me the next key, give me the next value, give me the next key, give me the next value until it feels like it's gotten all the fields um, or until there are no more keys. Actually, only until there are no more keys. Um, and then it will produce the value. If what the deserializer realizes is that there's a seek and not a map, it'll call visit seek on this visitor. Um, it'll do the same thing. It'll keep calling the seek access part of the deserializer to continually get the next value and ultimately produce a foo. Whew. Okay, so that's the deserialize. Does this make sense? We've now been through both serialize and deserialize. We're going to talk a little bit more about the subtleties here, but are there questions about the basic structure here of, of the serializer call graph and the deserializer call graph? Is there an attribute to force the generate of only seek or name deserializer visitors? No, that's a good question. I mean, the way that you do it is just you write your own implementation. Um, I don't know if there's an attribute you can set specifically. Uh, no, it doesn't look like it actually. I don't think so. Uh, except writing your own implementation. Okay. So that was a flurry through deserialize. So let's now look through, now that we have a, a rough idea of the structure here, let's look at the kind of attributes that you can have for certi derive. 
and sort of look at how they might change both the serialize and deserialize. We already looked at rename. Uh, rename all is the same, right? It's saying um, before you put in the field name in deserialize and serialize code, uh, you know, turn things into lowercase, turn things into uppercase, that kind of stuff. Easy enough. Deny unknown fields we talked about uh, only applies to deserialization. Uh, and in fact, I mean, we can we can add this um, if we want to see what it looks like. So if I now look at this, most of this code is going to look basically the same. Um, one difference you'll see is that now uh, up here, when we match on the key in uh, visit map, there's no longer a sort of field ignore that calls ignore any on next value. Uh, and further up here, the field visitor, if it now gets a, um, a name of a field that it doesn't recognize, it just errors rather than producing field ignore uh, because there is no field ignore in the field enum. Um, tag type, okay, so this goes into how we do enums. Mm. So let's hold that for a second and then we'll look at enums. Um, tag, tag, untag, that's fine. Um, Certy bound, this is a way to um, get the Certy auto-generated code to include additional bounds that might be necessary. Um, this is because by, by default, when you derive Certy and uh, Certy deserialize and serialize, um, the impl of deserialize and the impl of serialize just generate this impl block. Uh, but imagine the foo was like generic over some x, right? And it, foo only is deserialized when x implements uh, radical, right? Um, then certy has no way to know that this bound is required in order for deserialize on foo to work, right? So the reason why this might be necessary is that imagine that our struct foo x has a field x of type x and the impl of deserialize for x uh, only works where x is radical. Or let's say there's a bar and the implementation for bar of x is only when x is radical. Right, so this might be one reason why you need such a bound is because this impl exists and is constrained. And so in your definition of food, there's not even a mention of radical. And so the derived implementation wouldn't know that this bound is necessary. Uh, and so that's where you can use uh, sorty bound. And this one, you know, it, it's really just it copy pastes the text you put in here into the basically here uh, after the impl deserialize and same for impl serialize. Um, just copy paste whatever you, you put in bound there. Uh, default, default is a fun one. Uh, let's look at what default does. Uh, so let's do here, sorty default. Uh, so what default is saying is if this field isn't in the input, then um, actually here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do even better. Uh, expanded and then we're gonna do sorty default and we're gonna expand that to expanded two. And then we're gonna diff expanded to expanded to. I know this is very narrow, uh, but you'll see very much of the code that was produced is actually the same. You see it's 170 lines here that are the same. Uh, and the place where it differs is down here. Let me expand this a little bit. Uh, so we're here in, this is in the deserialized code. And you see that if after having extracted the fields, we find that field one is none, then in the old implementation, we would error saying invalid length. And in the new generation, we set the value to be default. That's the only thing it changes. Oh, that gets hidden by my face here. So it changed from producing an error if field one was none to producing just the default value into that field instead. 
uh, and default equals path is just call this function to get the default rather than um, using the default trait. Uh, remote, I think we're not really going to talk about. Um, transparent is similar to repr transparent. This is just saying don't try to generate any code for this type. Like don't you know, call deserialize struct with a thing that has only one field and stuff. Just directly call the serialize and serialize on the um, the single inner values. This only works for new type structs. Um, uh, 30 from and try from. So this is used if you have proxy types where you want to say, uh, hey, 30, in order to, like, let's see, um, let me give you here. Um, so this is going to say, sorry, deserialize into a string and then use the from trait to turn that string into a foo. So that way, foo doesn't need to implement deserialize. Only this type needs to implement deserialize. And then cert is going to take care of the conversion just by calling the, the from trait. This, this can be really useful if you have um, a type that's from some other crate, for example, here. And that crate doesn't implement deserialize for its types. It doesn't have a dependency on certy at all. So you can have your own type that can be deserialized. And then all you need to do is implement a mapping from your type into that crate's type. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, yeah, so default on the container is just the same as default on all fields. Um, so that's from and try from and into, they're all sort of analogous here. Um, Certi crate is just used for, uh, you know, in this, in the generated code here, there are a bunch of places where it refers to, let me go up to the top of this, extern crate sorty as underscore sorty. Um, sometimes you want to use a different crate than sorty, or you have sorty available, but under a different name. And so this just lets you change what this value is. Um, so if we said here, uh, crate equals foobar, See if it even lets me do that. It might not. Yeah, it's gonna refuse to do that. This doesn't work because I haven't actually set it up so that foobar works, but maybe if I do, let's see how that works. So if I do foobar package equals 30, I don't know if it'll let me do this. Bring in the same dependency twice. Yeah, maybe if I do this, foobar. There we go. So now it uses foobar as sorty instead of having its own like external crate sorty. That's all it changes. It just changes all of the imports. Like anywhere where this type is talking about sorty, it, it um, uses the name you specified instead. Uh, those are all the container attributes. So let's then talk about enums. Um, so in, if this is an enum foo instead, and it has bar and buzz, uh, and let's say this has a, something like this. Uh, and then now we expand. Let's see what we get here. So now this is an enum instead. Um, and what gets generated is, is very similar, actually. Um, you see for serialize, now we still, we call, instead of serialize struct, we call serialize struct variant. And the main difference between serialize struct and serialize struct variant is that we give both the name of the enum itself and the name of the variant and the index of the variant in the definition of the enum. Again, for formats that don't bother um, encoding the, the names of the types into the thing and just rely on the sequence. Um, and what we get back from that is, again, a sort of constructor, uh, this time that implements the serialized struct variant trait rather than the serialized struct trait. 
And it has a serialized field, just like the other ones, so very, very similar code. Uh, it calls end. So this is should be entirely unsurprising. Um, for deserialize, uh, things are a little different. So for deserialize, uh, we, where's the, yeah, so this is, uh, when it says field visitor here, what is actually a visitor of is the variant name, right? So you see here, it can visit a U64, which is the index of the variant. So again, variant index here. Field is a little misleading because it's not a struct field at the moment. Um, it can visit a string, in which case it expects the name of the variant, and same with bytes. Um, and then the deserialize is uninteresting. This is deserialize identifier like before. Visitor for foo now is where we're going to see things be a little different. So we're going to expect to be visiting an enum. And when we do, uh, we want to know from the data format, okay, you're visiting an enum. What is the variant of this enum? So again, the data format gets to dictate how enums are encoded, right? Through basically how it implements um, the enum access trait and deserialize enum, which we'll see later. And so we say, okay, tell me the variant. And if that is field zero, then, and then you see here, this, this code now sort of nests, right? So this is first deserializing which variant am I in? And then if it discovers that it's in field zero, which is bar, then it just generates out the code for deserializing that variant type. Right, so, so and they can do this because the the deserialized code. If we go all the way up here, the deserialized code for this is exactly the same as the deserialized code for just struct bar with one field u64. So that's why it just when it generates the the deserialized for a foo, it really just generates the code for a deserialized for bar and a deserialized for baz, like for each variant separately, and then it generates a sort of macro, like a an outer deserialized for it that determines which of those it should use. And so that's what we're seeing down here, is uh, down do, 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 is. It first asks for which variant, and depending on the variant, it calls either the derived deserialized for variant one, which has visit u64, visit string for the fields. Uh, so this is all basically the code we looked up from the old foo. And then a little further down here, this is if the variant we got was field one, then again, this is just the derived deserialized code for the baz variant, the second variant. Um, and then if we go to the bottom of that, we see this is the end of the uh, visitor implementation for foo. Then we call deserialize enum. Again, instead of deserialize struct, um, we give foo, which is the name of the enum. Instead of the list of fields, we give the list of the variants, uh, and then we give the visitor, and that's all there is to it. Now, where this gets, you know, where, where the details are here is in uh, when we say, sorry for all the scrolling, I know it's gonna be disorienting. Um, when we tell the data format, which variant are we in? How it determines this is gonna matter a lot. And this is gonna, this is gonna vary by data format, right? Mm. And not just by data format, but even within a data format, you might have multiple ways of encoding an enum. In fact, if we go back to the 30 bit here, you'll see enum representations. So there's a separate page on enum representations um, that gives you, know, here's an example, um, uh, an example type. So they can be externally tagged, in which case the variant is placed outside a representation of the contents of that variant, right? So this is just, you separately serialize the contents of it, and then you'd make that the value of a thing that holds the variant. So that's what Surdy refers to as externally tagged. Um, and that's what it uses by default here. Um, internally tagged is you have a field, you, you serialize the contents of the type, 
but you add an additional field inside that serialization that tells you which variant you're in. So that would be something here like type request. Uh, and you have adjacently tagged, uh, which is that you you separate the you encode a sort of tuple of the variant and the uh, the contents of that variant. Um, like here, you know, T is the the variant name, and C is the encoding of that variant. And then untagged, which is you don't even encode which variant it is. You just serialize the contents. And so when you deserialize an untagged, you basically just look at what fields you're given, and depending on which fields you're given, you make an assumption about which variant it originally was. We, we can look at untagged too. There's, there's a lot of interesting complexity in how you uh, deserialize an untagged. Uh, so let's look at what happens if we try to switch this to uh, an internally tagged thing here. So if we go back here and we say, sorty tag, uh, the value here is the name of the field inside the representation. We can use tab, that's fine. Um, Expanded.rs and expanded int rs. So let's see here. Okay, so one of the things that changes in serialize here is that instead of serializing a particular variant, we're actually now just serializing a struct. So basically we're not telling the data format that what we're serializing is an enum. We're just telling it, we're gonna serialize a struct now and it just happens to have an extra field. So. It's not like this is cheating, right? But it's, it's basically saying that if you use internal tagging, then a, then as far as the data format is concerned, this just isn't an enum anymore. Um, this is just a, a struct that happens to have one field more. And so that's gonna be represented in the remainder of the code. So there's gonna be a, a pretty big diff here. Uh, so if I just open expanded int and we look at the implementation of serialize, it really just serializes a foo, and then it serializes a field called type where the value is bar. And then it serializes all the other fields. So this one is actually very straightforward. It's really just serialize it as it, serialize and deserialize as if it were a struct with one additional field. So for deserialize, uh, if we go back here, um, so you see we have, we still have a type that represents which variant. So field zero here is bar, field one is baz. Um, we implement deserialize, that's fine. Deserialize any. I just say, so here there's some like private types involved. So the deserialize any here is telling the I wonder why this is a deserialize any and not a deserialize struct. That's interesting. Yeah, so this is telling the deserializer, okay, deserialize whatever comes next, uh, and we're gonna visit it using this tagged content visitor, which apparently is the thing that's in uh, Surti itself. So let's go look at what that looks like. Um, Sorty source, uh, where did it come from? Private DE tagged content visitor. Pub use self content. Self content. Oh, it's just a sub module in the same file. Private DE. Pubstruct, here we go. Uh, not public API. Yeah, so this is a public type that's basically hidden from the API that the generated code gets to use just so that it doesn't have to generate just tons and tons of code um, in every implementation. So what does this visitor do? Internally tagged enums are only supported in self-describing formats. I wonder why why this isn't just considered a 
struct serialization. I guess it's because you are changing the struct. So it's sort of, it would be weird to have this be part of your schema because you're already having your data type be a different definition from what's actually in the format. So maybe that's the rationale here. Um, so visitor for tagged content. Uh, if it's a sequence, it expects the first thing to be that the tag. Uh, if it's a map, then it... Oh, interesting. If it's a map, it visits everything in the map um, and sees, is the thing I just visited the same as the tag field? And if so, then we know that this is the value of the tag. Otherwise, just store it. And the reason you have to store it here is you're basically buffering, right? If, if you know that this is a, an internally tagged enum, then you need, to, you need to keep parsing out of the data format until you get the thing that tells you which variant it is. And that means that anything that you parse out of the data format before you get to the tag, you have to put somewhere because you're later going to have to actually use those values in your deserialization. So that's what this vector is for. This is just keeping around um, those extra fields, those fields that you passed by while trying to get to the tag. Um, and it looks like it actually walks all the way through. So it doesn't try to like stop early when it hits the tag. It actually just walks all of them so that the the tagged content has the tag and a vector of all of the other fields. And so this is one of the reasons why this representation is actually going to be slightly less performant than the externally tagged variant because it has to buffer. Um, and this might be the reason why it needs to serialize any two. Well, unclear. Um, okay, so tagged content, do, 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 do. So the visitor for the thing that tells you whether this is the tag or not the tag is just, if it is the name of the thing that they said they wanted us to tag, then it's the tag, otherwise it's content. That's fine. Um, and then, right, and then there's a deserializer. So basically... We're gonna sort is gonna treat the uh, the the buffered list of fields we walked past as a data format and implement deserializer for it, and and this makes a lot of sense, right? Because it is a thing that holds data that can be turned into other data types, and so uh, so you see down here, you know the the content that we stored up here, the vector. Where did it go? This content vector is a map that holds the vector of all the key value pairs. And when we implement deserializer for that, we're just going to walk the content. And, you know, for depending on what type we ended up putting in there, uh, we're actually going to, you know, call the appropriate visitor method. And one thing that's interesting here is when we deserialize into content, uh, so map next value here, we're not mapping this into the value that is, um, uh, let's, let's backtrack here a little bit. Um, imagine that the enum variant has, you know, one field that's a U64 and one field that's a string. This code doesn't yet know which variant you're in. And so therefore it has to, and, but it has to capture all of the fields that it walked by until it gets to the tag. And in fact, it just collects all of the ones that are not the tag, but it doesn't know it's their types yet. So it has to deserialize them because it has to buffer them for later, but it doesn't know which concrete type to deserialize them into. And therefore, it has to deserialize them just directly into the data model. And that's what this content thing is. So uh, let's see if I can easily find its definition. Um, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, so you see tagged content here has a content. Let's see if we can find its definition here. Uh, here we go. Aha. So content, the content enum here is the SERDI data model. Like it's a, it's a data type that can hold any value in the data model. And so this is why the format has to be self-describing. As we walk 
through the fields that we don't know their type yet, we can't give any hints because we don't know which enum variant we're in. Uh, and so we don't know what the type is expected to be. So we just need to deserialize any, which means the format needs to be self-describing. And what we grab out of the data format, we store directly into this content thing, which encodes all of the possible values in the data model. So you see it has all the integer types, it has the floating types, characters, strings, uh, new type seek, and map. And actually, I happen to know, if you look a little bit over here, you see uh, to buffer the contents of the deserializer when deserializing untagged enums and internally tagged enums. So this is the same trick that's used for untagged, except there, you don't even know what you're looking for. You're just going to grab all of them and they're just going to try deserialize based on this uh, buffered content that is just a direct encoding of the, of the data model. And the, there is a separate crate called Surdy value that has this publicly exposed, um, this enum. And I know that there's some work on trying to move that into Surdy. I don't know there's been any progress on that work, in part because it's it should be rare that you actually need this in your own code, um, but it is possible that you do. And I think some people just use um, Surdy JSON value for this, even though Surdy value is the, the more appropriate mapping for the data model. Okay, so going all the way back to the code that we had here, that's the reason we call deserialize any is because we don't know all of the stuff that's going to be in type. We don't know the, the full definition of this type yet. And so we just need to say, visit this, and one of the things that you will visit is going to be the tag, and anything else we'll tell you later. Uh, and then we're going to match on the tag that the tag content visitor found. And if it's field zero, remember field zero here is really bar. Um, then we're in the bar variant. And so then we have a visitor for bar. This again is just the regular derive for um, the definition of the bar variant. So it visits the fields. And the interesting thing is gonna be where we, so this is just the same auto-generated deserialized for the variants that we looked at before. So I'm scrolling past it. Um, but when we call deserialize, what we're going to do is we're going to call deserialize any. Uh, this one could probably be deserialize struct because at this point we do know the type. But let's ignore that for now. Um, so here we're creating one of these content deserializers that we, that we looked at from Surdy itself. right? So this, we're going to give the content of the tag. So the content here is that, that vector of the content enum, which is the direct encoding of the data model. And this implements the serializer just by calling the appropriate visit method for whatever that um, stored data model value is with the visitor that we just had. I know that was a, uh, that's a lot to take in at once. So ask me questions about how this was confusing so that I can try to explain it again. This is certainly like a tricky deserializer, but that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it is because if you're implementing deserialize yourself, these are the kinds of subtleties that sometimes you have to think about if you do get into really like weird uh, data, data types, or in some cases, data formats. Although all of this is currently data type stuff. Uh, for, for field one, for Baz, it's the same thing, right? It, this is the derived deserialize for the definition of Baz. And then at the end, we just call deserialize any with the content deserializer, with the content of the tagged, with the visitor that we just generated. And so this is one of the reasons why visitor comes up here, right? Is the visitor is the real implementation of deserialize. Um, and then we sort of, this is, the implementation of deserialize is the connection between the visitor and the particular deserializer that we end up using. Um, okay, so for adjacently tagged, you know, this is going to be similar to externally tagged. It's just that instead of using the value of a field, you look for the value of an adjacent field by some name. So this one's not going to be that interesting. Um, untagged 
is probably going to be interesting, but I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to not talk about untagged here. It's basically the same as internally tagged, except that you don't get to look for a tag. So you just end up with that vector of contents, and then you're just going to try deserialize each for, for each data format. And this means you need to do even more buffering because you might start to deserialize into one of the variants and then like halfway through walking content, realize actually this is not the right variant. And so now you're going to have to try deserialize into another variant, but that means you still need to deserialize the parts of content that you already walked to deserialize them in the previous variant attempt. Um, and so there's a little bit more complexity around there, um, but that gets very in the weeds. Um, okay, so that's enums. We've talked about their serialization and their deserialization. We can look at the variant attributes to see if there's anything interesting. Rename, not really. Alias is just um, allow it to be deserialized with multiple different names. Uh, it's not too interesting. Skip is not that interesting here. Serialize with and deserialize with are also, now that we know how all this code actually works, is they're not that interesting because most of what they do is just change the generated code so that instead of call, you know, passing in a reference to the underlying type, you have a little constructor around it that instead calls this method rather than calling the um, deserialized method directly on that the type of the, the field. Uh, same with with, bound we talked about. Borrow and other. Um, okay, so other is just, is for tagged enums where you can say, if the tag didn't match, if like if none of the tagged enums, if none of the variants were matched by the data that came out of the data format, use this variant instead. Uh, so it's sort of a fallback, if you will, or default variant. Uh, borrow is, uh, um, do I want to talk about borrow? B borrow, I think, is mainly there to ensure that Surti generates the appropriate bounds. So this, this happens for something like, um, let's go back to our struct foo. It had a AU64 and a B string, right? So if we instead wanted to generate this, or perhaps more, more interestingly, something like this, So if we do this, then the serialize is straightforward, right? Because this is just serializing a string. That's totally fine. We know how to do that. Um, but for deserialize, you know, where this gets tricky is if the underlying data format gives us a reference to a string, then we want this to continue to use that reference. We want it to turn into cow borrowed. Um, but if it doesn't, if it produces an own string, then we want to produce the cow owned version of this. And in either case, this will the deserialize will only work if the DE lifetime outlives the tick A lifetime. And I'll, I'll let you mull over that separately. Um, but we need to tell Serde that it should associate tick A with tick D, uh, DE, because otherwise, if we don't, um, it doesn't. It, it's going to generate a deserialize implementation here where tick A and tick DE are unrelated. And that won't work because if we are truly going to deserialize from a reference of DE into this field, which has lifetime tick A, there has to be an association with it. Namely, DE has to live for at least as long as A does. Uh, and so that's where you stick in surdy borrow like this. Um, and we can look at what, what happens if we generate this. Uh, so do, 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 serialize is still the same. It's a serialized field. It's not terribly interesting. Uh, deserialize, you see here, there's an impl which has the lifetimes DE and A. Deserialize DE for foo A. There's no association between the two of them. And when it visits a stir, uh, doo, 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 doo. uh, visit seek, that's fine. 
It deserializes the cow tick A. That's fine. So all the code here looks basically exactly the same as it used, used to. And that's fine, you know. But when we do cargo check here, uh, I would need to write some code that actually uses the simple of deserialize. But if you ever try to use this, you would get an error from the compiler saying um, that DE doesn't live long enough. Um, and in fact, I can, I mean, I can do this, I suppose. Uh, 30 JSON is version one. And we're going to do um, JSON from string. And it's fine that it doesn't actually work. Ooh. Why? Oh, interesting. Maybe it just... Did I miss a special casing here? Uh, I don't think so. That's interesting. I wonder why that works. Because it shouldn't. Oh, let me get rid of the stuff in between. Oh, it is static. You're right. Uh, let's do... No, that'll still work. Um, oh, by default, cow will always become owned. That's why. It only becomes borrowed when used with sturdy bar. Okay, so cow is sort of special cased here. Um, so I could do this instead by saying uh, cow2. Borrowed. It's not going to like this, is it? Uh, yeah, there's more trickiness here. Uh, so, okay, so the, the answer is the cow is kind of special case here, where cow will always turn into a borrowed string, not stir. Uh, and therefore, it can assume any lifetime here. It wouldn't work if I did this, for example. Why on earth does that work? Oh, because here tick A just gets set to D. Um, mm, how can I make this fail so that I can show what it does? Hmm. I wish I had an example of the top of my head here. Uh, yeah, use any other type. The cow and, and stir here are, are sort of special cased. If I just did that, that's not gonna, it's not gonna like that. But if I did bool, maybe. Okay, uh, great. So here it's gonna complain at me uh, and the, the, we don't need the drop anymore. Great. So here it complains saying, oh, the deserialize not implemented for bool. Uh, fine. Fine, 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 fine. We'll derive struct bar tick A, and we're going to have a phantom data tick A. And then this is going to be a bar tick A. Uh, whatever. Why is it okay with me doing this? Uh, now I'm confused. It should not be okay with me doing this. Uh, unless if I had to do borrow on this one. Uh, so. 
Great. Okay. So now we finally get the error I was after, which is lifetime may not live long, long enough. The lifetime tick A is defined here, and the implementation of deserialize for bar requires that DE must outlive A. And this is the error we would have gotten for cow as well uh, if it wasn't special case. And the trick here, of course, is we want Surti, when it implements the deserialize thing here, to, to add the bound that DE is going to outlive tick A. Because that is the case in which this is okay. Because this will just be a, in fact, we could do, uh, we can make this be a stir so the explanation is a little easier. Um, you know, this string reference in here is going to be a reference into the string that was passed all the way down in the deserializer into its input. And in order for that to be the case, it has to be the case in the deserialize implementation here that there's a bound saying DE outlives tick A. That's the only way in which this will end up being valid. And Surti borrow makes it so that we have that bound. And uh, and it, it's not going to do anything particularly special. Like if I expand this, um, you'll notice all of this is going to be pretty much the same. Uh, the only difference is going to be here. Implement visitor D for visitor DA. Uh, and you see it has here a bound saying D outlives tick A. And the generated value is just tick A. So the only thing that borrowed really changed was it, it added a, this, this constraints between the DE and the, the, the A lifetime parameter. Uh, and we'll see this on the impl deserialize2, which is near the top, uh, here. So that's that bound too. And I mean, I can show you without, uh, although, it, no, it won't compile, so I can't show you without. Um, and if we, if we did cow here now, so if we now go back to what we originally had, with Surti borrow, then if I now expand this, um, what we would hope, right, is that if you get a string reference, it turns into a cow borrowed. If you don't, it turns into a cow owned. Um, and indeed, if we scroll down here uh, for the visitor, again, this is the visitor for creating a foo. And you see there's now a visit seek, that's fine. All right, so here, the code for deserializing this field has changed a little bit. It's no longer just uh, deserializing a string. It creates its own little deserialize with that holds a value that's a cow. Uh, and it implements, it generates an implementation of deserialize for it. And it uses this borrow, borrow cow stir implementation from uh, Surti private. So let's go look at that one. Uh, sort of, uh, over here. Uh, oh. Borrow coster. So this is, it has a cow string visitor. And you see, if it visits a string, like a, if it visits a string down here, it creates a cow owned. If it visits a stir, then it creates a cow owned. Um, but if it visits a borrowed string, that is a string where you have a reference that it, that is going to be long lived. It's going to live as long as the input to the data format. Then you can produce cow borrowed. Uh, visit stir is if you have a string reference, but it doesn't point into the data format, data format's input. So it's not a long lived string. Um, so specifically, this extra function is the thing we wanted, which is if it turns out that this can be a reference all the way back to the input, then generate a cow borrowed. Uh, and same thing for bytes. So this visit bytes and this visit borrowed bytes. Uh, so that's what borrow does. It, it primarily adds this DE bound, but what that enables is that your implementation can, um, can now have fields that ultimately borrow from the, the data format's input. Whew. Okay, so now we've been through all the variant attributes. The field attributes are mostly the same. Uh, flatten, just for time, I'm not going to talk about flatten. It's not super interesting. Um, and borrow, we've talked about. Uh, remote types, we're not going to talk about. Okay, 
So then the question becomes, okay, what's left? Well, we haven't really talked about the data format, but the data format actually isn't that interesting. Um, let's look at here. So there's a there's a page on writing a data format in the the Certi docs, and it talks a little bit about conventions, about like you should have a an error type that's shared between serialization and deserialization. Um, you should have a serializer, you should have a deserializer, and roughly what the names of the methods should be, what convenience methods you should um, implement, uh, and what modules you should have. This is just basically how should you structure your um, your data format. Uh, error handling talks about a little bit, you know, the kinds of um, errors that might come up, and in particular the fact that you have to support custom messages. So these are errors from the data type. Um, so if the data type says, you know, I was expecting this kind of input, you want that to be possible to propagate up through the data format, so through the deserializer and serializer implementations. Um, this is not super important, it's just a little detail. Um, but the implement interesting parts are implementing a serializer and implementing a deserializer. And one of the things that is stressed a lot in this documentation, because it's, it's important, is that Certi is not a parsing library. It does not give you any mechanisms for parsing or interpreting a data format or for producing that data format. It just provides you with the connection to the serialized and deserialized trait implementations of data types. It Basically, it gives you a connection to the CERTI data model. Um, how you parse JSON, for example, is not CERTI's business. Um, all you are expected to do, let's talk about serializer first because it's sort of the easiest one, um, to implement Serializer, all you really have to do, and let's, it gives the example here of JSON, is you have to implement the Serializer trait, which has an OK and an error associated type. The OK type, generally, you're not going to return um, a thing. So if you serialize to JSON, for example, you're not going to return a string. Instead, the Serializer type itself is going to hold your output um, because it might be like a file writer, for example, where you don't really want to have to buffer it into memory and then write it out. You just want the serializer to directly call into the underlying um, uh, output socket, for example. So the when the serializer has finished, it, has, it hasn't produced a value. Hence, type OK equals unit here. Uh, and the error type is the error type. We talked about these um, sort of sub-serializers. Uh, oftentimes, especially for simple data formats, you can just keep this all to one type. Uh, sometimes you want to separate them out, but it's not terribly important for what we're talking about right now. Uh, and then you really just want to implement all the serialize methods, right? So serialize a bool. Well, in JSON, at least, just write true or false. Serializing numbers, in JSON, they're all serialized the same way, which is the string representation of the number, but without quotes. Um, uh, serializing characters, serializing strings. You know, you really just want to implement all of these for whatever makes sense for your data format. Um, and then for things like serializing structs or um, enums, then usually, at least for some data formats, you're just going to turn those into the equivalents of dictionaries, right? So they're just going to be maps. Um, and similarly, sequences are going to turn into arrays. Uh, new types are mostly going to be the same as as if they were a struct, but some for some data formats like protobufs, for example, there might be more specific encodings that you could use. Um, and so for sequence here, for example, you see what serialize seek does is it starts the sequence and then returns self as a serialize seek implementation. So remember, this is like a separate trait, um, associated type that implements a trait. Uh, and if we go down to the implementation of serialize seek, you see that it has a serialize element, you implement that, and it just prints, you know, adds a comma to the output and then serializes itself. Same with maps, you know, it's going to, oh, the call to serialize map uh, is going to emit a curly bracket and then return self and the implementation of serialize, uh, where do we have it? Serialize map is just going to add commas and then add colons between the key and the value. Uh, and ultimately the end is just going to be a, a closing curly. So serializing really just is, you're told what to serialize, now do the thing. Um, so not that bad. Deserialization is a little trickier. Uh, and in particular, what you have to do is, again, Certi is not a parsing library. Uh, when you implement serializer, 
uh, deserializer, I mean, you have the choice of whether to implement deserialize any or not. Um, for self-describing formats, you generally want to implement deserialize any. Uh, and for any that you can't, you're not going to implement that method and it's just going to error if someone calls it by default. Um, and usually your deserialize any is just going to forward to the appropriate other deserialize implementation. Um, and then you implement the appropriate deserialize uh, the appropriate uh, well, so there are two parts to this, right? So there is, if you're told to deserialize a bool, then you first want to extract a bool or try to extract a bool from your input, right? So in the case of JSON, the string um, or, you know, the byte buffer or whatever. And then you want to pass that value to the appropriate visit method on the visitor that you passed in. So really all you're doing is you know, parse the format however you choose to parse it, and then give it back into the the deserialize the data type through the data model using the visitor. So you see, all these implementations are basically all the same, right? They are call visit of the appropriate type with the thing that you got out of your input by parsing, right? So parse assigned integer, pass it to visit. Um, and then there are you know a couple of things that are a little more involved, things like uh, Deserializing options, for example, you need to know how your data format represents values that may or may not be there. Um, and then if we look at deserialize sequence, you look for an open bracket and then you create, you call visit seek and you create a type that represents your parser for the contents of a sequence. So in this case, comma separated here is really just a type that the you own as in the data format owns that is a parser for the stuff that goes in arrays and it is going to implement the access seek trait so that you can so that the the caller can keep calling um you know next uh next element or next value uh, and then ultimately once there are no more comma separated values, then you check that you in fact have a closing thing for the array and otherwise you, you emit an error because the data format was broken. So same things for maps, right? So if we go back to map, look for an open curly bracket, has a comma separated parser, calls visit map. So there's an implementation of access map for comma separated. Um, and we can go down and look at that too. So seek access for comma separated is just see whether we're at the end. If we're not, look for a comma. Uh, if you find a comma, then you just deserialize the thing that is between you and the comma, and then you emit that value up to next element. And map is gonna be very similar, right? We, we look for a comma that separates elements, and then, uh, so that, that's gonna be the next key is the thing that follows the next comma, and the next value is the thing that follows the next colon. But again, how you actually parse your data format is not Surti's business. All you are supposed to do is implement the serializer and deserializer traits uh, and these sort of access traits for whatever your, your sub parsers are for um, maps, sequences, tuples, structs, that kind of stuff. Whew. Okay, I think that means we're all the way through. I don't think there are any other things I really wanted to talk about for Surti. There's obviously a more, bunch more stuff to it, like you know, how Surti Derive does its code generation. I'm not gonna go into that. That's a, that's a very low level here. Or you know, looking at the actual implementation of serializer and deserializer for um, Surti JSON, or look at the implementation of deserialize and serialize for Surti JSON value. Um, those are interesting things to look at. There's a lot of like good juicy stuff there if you want to pick up more about how Surti works. Um, but it's not really something we need to spend time on here. Uh, and so I think with that, let's see if there are any questions at the tail end here because I've, I've talked a lot. Um, but hopefully some of this now makes sense and you feel like you can start, you can rewatch some of it maybe uh, and then go and dig into this on your own. And now hopefully you have more of the the mental model and the um, sort of terminology and basic on this understanding of the types involved and the traits involved uh, to figure the rest out yourself. And we did it on time too. It's pretty good.
Also, yeah, I mean, Surti is... It, it's really fun to read through Surti because there's so much um, smart engineering. Like, it's a, it's a cool architecture. Um, you know, th there's been a decent amount of, like, let's come up with a a better Surti or Surti has these problems and we want to fix them. And I think those efforts are really good. There are certainly cases where you can improve upon Surti. Um, but I still think Surti in and of itself is an accomplishment. And I, I know uh, David is in chat, so clap for, clap for David. Um, or D Tolne for those who don't know that the D stands for David. Um, and... All right, I don't see any more questions in chat. I'll, I'll give YouTube a couple of you know, minutes to catch up. All right. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. It's on here, apparently. Apparently, we are now on here. Hey, look at that. Um, I, I will add that, so I'm going to, as usual, I'll, I'll upload this to YouTube afterwards. And that will actually have like chapter marks that people can scan through and stuff. So I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link to that later on. Uh, that'll be a better thing to embed than the link to the live stream. Nice. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, hopefully that was useful. Uh, I'm hoping to do more of these decrusted things. I, I think they're going to be a useful thing for the ecosystem to go through. Um, there are a couple of other things that I think are really good crates that are candidates for going through this kind of decrusted thing. Like, um, I think Tokyo is a good candidate. Tower is probably a good candidate. Rayon, maybe Crossbeam, um, Pin, Nom. I, I think there are a bunch of good candidates here. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about this, um, this new series. And now that I'm actually going to do streams every four weeks. I, th I think this is going to be, uh, we're, we're going to see some good streams. All right. Clap, maybe. Axum. Th there's lots of good candidates. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. And uh, I'll see you next time, whatever the next stream is. There might still be more streams than every four weeks, if I have the time. But at least there, there will be a stream every four weeks now. Thank you all. Bye.